Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I think we have everyone. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Akshay, who I think needs no introduction, but he's the audience here. Uh, so Akshay has been a PhD student for the last several years and uh, worked on a number of different projects, and he's going to be telling you about his dissertation um, research on protocol architecture. And that's really sort of the intellectual core of what he does. And the, you get students who are, you know, who do lots of different types of work and um, the intellectual underpinnings of the work could range all the way from algorithms to, uh, you know, hardcore system development. And I think the thing that characterizes actually really uniquely is that uh, he, he can do a number of those things, but he's a really good protocol architect. And uh, you're going to hear about some of that. The other thing that's interesting about him is he has more collaborations than I can count. He, has, he collaborates extremely widely with lots of different people across not just MIT or um, you know, the local area, but all around. And um, I think uh, it's a collaborative social butterfly. And I think that's made other people's projects great. Very selfless with respect to spending his time and um, intellect on other people's projects and devoting the same degree of attention to those projects as to his. I think that's another really um, noteworthy attribute. So without further ado, tell us about your thesis research. Oh, I should say that there's the open portion. You can ask questions, I assume, in the middle of yep. the talk, and please do, so it's interactive. And then there's the closed portion of the defense. Uh, I should thank uh, his committee members, uh, Scott Schenker and Panda and Mohammed. For joining, so we'll do the first portion of the defense, you know. And if he comes out alive, then you can do something about it. All right. Yeah, yeah. So thanks. Uh, first of all, let's. I, I wanted to personally thank everyone. It goes here. Uh, personally, thank everyone for coming, both the uh, people who are here in person and on Zoom. So the title of my of my thesis is enabling configurable, extensible, and modular network stacks. But before we can understand what a network stack is and why we might care about making it configurable or extensible or whatever, let's start with the idea of applications or apps. And I think a lot of us have heard this word um, and even non-technical people are sort of very familiar with the idea of applications. And these applications are basically individual user facing pieces of functionality that run on computers. So these applications were and still are built using a combination of uh, shared hardware um, resources uh, and individual application logic. And the idea is that this shared application, uh, the, the shared libraries and access to hardware is something that was provided by this thing that we call the operating systems kernel, which is uh, the, the thing that I've highlighted in red on this, uh, on this ad from the 80s. So of course, applications have changed over the years. And one of the most important ways that they've changed is that there's been an introduction of applications that use the network. And this has been become such an important category of applications that it's hard to imagine modern life today without this kind of category of applications that use the network. And in fact, we're using one such application right now. So you know, you can't really argue with the, the effect that networked applications have had. So how do we go and write one of these networked applications? Well, given that we just talked about the operating system providing access to shared hardware resources, it seems reasonable that we should expect the operating system to provide access to network hardware as well. And that's exactly what happened historically. So developers have added a, a new component to operating systems, the network stack, that gave app applications access to network hardware. So the reason it's called the network stack is that it's composed of these layers, each of which provides a slightly higher level abstraction to the components below. So the lowest layers start with the actual network hardware, like things that you can touch. And then from there, we get local networks and then internetworks as in the internet. And then we get machine level services like multiplexing and reliability and so on. So from our application, what do we actually need to do to use the network stack? Well, the canonical answer historically has been to use the socket API, which is the API that the kernel's networking stack exposes. So the kernel is going to expose a bunch of functions or syscalls to our application. And then by calling those functions, our application can use the network. So what is this API actually doing? From the left. Okay, from the left, there's the network infrastructure, which is the system that actually transmits packets. And on the right, we have our application. And then the network stack with its socket interface in the middle is exposing an interface that connects these two things together. So one important feature here is that the structure of layered abstractions um, in the network and the network stack 
has a well-defined and standardized set of functionality uh, that it provides, which is this best effort delivery of packets. And this uh, abstraction has been general enough to support a wide range of applications over the past several decades. But why has the network stack been so successful and what lessons can we learn from that success? So one of the big lessons for me has been that layering is really powerful and that providing layered abstractions over underlying hardware has helped application developers achieve flexibility and extensibility as in being able to change their applications rapidly despite changes in the underlying network infrastructure. So in fact, this idea of providing abstractions over hardware and infrastructure is really one of the big ideas that's made modern applications adaptable and flexible across many of their components, including the compute that they run on and even the components that they use to build parts of themselves. So we now have managed versions of crucial application components like databases, storage, and so on. And the application developer mostly doesn't even have to worry about how they're going to operate these crucial parts of their application's infrastructure. But let's take a little bit of a closer look at the way that applications are using the network. So my argument is going to be that changes to modern networks have started to erode this nice vision of abstractions in terms of how applications are using the network. So there are two types of changes that I think are especially important. And the first one is changes to the network infrastructure itself and how we access it. So for example, the adoption of RDMA networks and corresponding use of RDMA APIs to write applications or the use of cloud load balancing, which of course doesn't require application API changes, but the developer does need to go change their configuration in, um, in when they're deploying their application to make sure that the application is gonna work correctly. So I'd like to refer to this type of change as a shift towards new network data paths. So the path that the application's data is traversing has become more complicated over time and also gained more features. So if this shift towards new network data paths has been change number one, then the second change, and of course it's a related change, is a shift in the features that applications want from the network. So to gain access to these features, applications have adopted an ecosystem of libraries, which I'm going to broadly refer to as communication libraries, to help them unlock the features and performance of the network data path. So these communication libraries are more generally bridging the gap between the features that the application wants from the network and then the application's actual code. So some examples might be using the AWS SDK to access a published subscribe message queue in the cloud, or using the gRPC API, which then might run over quick or have its processing offloaded. Or if you're using the IB verbs library to access an RDMA network, then you might use some additional libraries to help with memory management or synchronization. So these two changes are actually kind of related to each other. As new, data, new network data paths allow us to put more functionality into the network, more communication libraries are going to be created that help implement those features in a way that applications can actually use them. So if we take a little bit of a step back and think about how these two changes, the new network data paths and the communication libraries have impacted our applications. Well, one of the things that stands out to me is that the traditional network stack with its well-defined layering model, which used to be very central to the way our applications use the network is now a relatively small component among many other components in terms of how application developers are actually interacting with the network. So that is now application developers are using some higher level API that provides them extra features like serialization or encryption or whatever. And these new APIs and communication libraries aren't carrying forward the same layered uh, structure of layered abstractions. And instead they tend to be structured kind of monolithically. So the uh, library is gonna provide some fixed set of uh, pluggability that it supports as well as some kind of programming model. And if your application wants some non-standard uh, pluggability or non-standard programming model, then you're sort of out of luck and you have to go try to find another library. And similarly, because communication libraries build on existing network data pads, they, start, they tend to assume a fixed data path underneath them rather than re remaining portable across multiple possible underlying data paths. And to be clear, I'm not saying that this new approach is necessarily bad. I'm, I think it's a good thing that applications are able to choose the functionality that they actually want based on what they want to do with the network rather than being limited to some narrow but universal API. But given that these communication libraries and new network data pads are an increasingly important part of how we actually build applications nowadays, I think it's worth exploring and understanding how they should fit together into how we're going to build applications. So this leads us to the main question that I want to discuss today, which is how should this shift towards new network data pads and their new features change the way that we write applications as well as the data pads themselves. So our goal here is going to be to recapture the flexibility and extensibility that we've enjoyed from using layered abstractions over other parts of our infrastructure. So this is of course a very broad question. And uh, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on two specific directions. So the first is on the application side. So given the modern landscape of communication libraries, how should applications best express that the functionality that they want from the network? And the second direction is about the data paths themselves. How can we structure these data paths to have the greatest amount of modularity possible? 
So I'm gonna discuss these two directions through the lens of two systems that I've worked on. So Bertha is a network stack that explicitly extends this idea of layering upwards into communication library territory. And CCP is a new way to structure congestion control functionality in data pads. And as I'll discuss a little bit later, I focused on congestion control here because it's an especially dynamic component of data pads. So I'll discuss Bertha first and then CCP afterwards and then finish uh, if I have time with a discussion of some directions for future work. Okay, so to explain why Bertha is useful, I'm gonna explain two drawbacks of this monolithic communication library approach. So a lack of composability and a lack of portability. So at a high level by composability, I mean the ability to use two or more potentially unrelated libraries together in the same application. And by portability, I mean the ability for applications to run correctly, no matter what the structure of their underlying network is. So let's look at how these two problems might affect us by looking at an example microservice application. So let's say our example application is gonna run within a container and that it wants network connections to provide serialization for a convenient application object interface, encryption for security, and it also wants routing rules such that if two containers are on the same machine, then communication between them should bypass virtual networking and encryption and use an optimized fast path instead. So how would composability play out in this application today? Well, communication libraries generally tend to expose sort of socket-like interfaces, since that's the programming model that many applications use. And this has the benefit that if we expose a socket-like interface to the application, then the application can keep its same programming model and just change the socket calls to the wrapped calls that this library provides. So the structure of a TLS library like OpenSSL is going to be that the library has some internal logic and the socket interface that the library provides is going, to, is going to wrap that logic. And then this internal logic is in turn going to make calls into the underlying data path APIs. So what happens when we try to compose this TLS library with our fast path library that we want to use? Well, both of these libraries are composed with the same socket interface, which means they both expect to uh, make calls into the underlying data path. But when we try to compose them together, this is not going to work because you, you can't, uh, the, the, the calls end up not working out. So one way to potentially go around this might be to unwrap the library and look at the internal logic blocks that, uh, that the library wants to use and sort of directly try to connect them together. But we don't really want the application developer to have to worry about this kind of issue because the application library, just, the application developer just wants to use these libraries rather than like restructure the libraries to make them work with their application. So on the portability side, one thing we can note is that library implementations will use a specific underlying data path because that's the data path that they make the underlying calls into. So now let's say you wanna run this application on a new data path, for example, switching from using the kernel networking stack to using RDMA via the IB verbs API. So just as we saw with our composability problem, there's an incompatibility here as well. So our library implementation is built to work with sockets underneath instead of uh, IB verbs calls. And using IB verbs isn't just an API change, it's a change in the programming model. So calls are non-blocking and, and there are other changes as well. So changing our library to use the IB verbs API, again, is gonna require knowledge about the internals of the library implementation that we don't want to require the application developer to have. So how can we think about addressing these shortcomings? For our composability problem, we want libraries to be pluggable with some standard composable interface. And one approach that people take today to address this is to build wrapper libraries that expose a single programming interface over some uh, diverse set of under underlying functionality. But even this only sort of takes us as far as compile time. The developer still needs to make sure that the other side of the connection, the whatever application that we're talking to on the other side is using a compatible uh, set of uh, configuration and, and composition of libraries uh, and implementation choices, because if they aren't, then we might get bugs at runtime. So instead, what we want is that when we're making the connection at runtime, we want a way to make sure that the endpoint that we're talking to has a compatible composition of, of libraries as us, instead of relying on convention or relying on the developer to configure the environment correctly. And not only that, but for our portability challenge, we want to make sure that it's um, easy to move our applications to different network environments without having to completely re-implement them. So, uh, my answer to these two challenges is an extensible and runtime reconfigurable networking stack that uh, I, we call Bertha. So we make it uh, extensible by allowing authors of communication libraries to plug in their libraries functionality into the network stack instead of having to wrap arbitrary other libraries. And the key idea here is that the stack is going to be runtime reconfigurable. So it's going to decide at runtime, specifically when it's establishing a connection, which implementation of each network feature the connection is going to use uh, and make sure that that decision is compatible with the other connection participants. So to go a little bit more in depth into what I mean by runtime reconfigurability, let's use another example of a feature our application might want, or which is sharding. 
So the objective here is to help the application scale by distributing requests from clients among multiple pieces or shards of the application. So doing this means we need a component that will take in client requests and forward them to the right shard according to some sharding policy. So there are naturally many ways that we can achieve this task, and it turns out that the right choice depends on the runtime environment. So doing sharding on the client is generally going to be pre uh, preferable for performance and scalability because we can skip a bunch of processing and save money in the middle of the network or on the server. But if the client is an energy constrained device like a phone, then this might not be a great idea and we might not want to be pushing that computation onto the, onto the client. So what developers end up doing instead nowadays is picking something that is universal, but not necessarily the best for each specific scenario, like using cloud-based or server-side sharding. So runtime reconfigurability is gonna let us avoid this cost by specializing the stack that we want to use in our application to whatever the application's runtime environment for each connection is. So in both, I'll use this term stack to talk about the set of features that an application wants for an individual connection. So the stack is just a set of communication libraries composed into a single data structure. So because we're interested in portability and runtime reconfigurability, the stack should be able to represent multiple possible options that Bertha can pick between for each connection. So the stack is gonna give us composition because it's made of libraries providing features composed together. And then by choosing between different stacks, we can achieve our other two goals of portability and runtime reconfigurability. So the next, for, for the next little part of this talk, I'm gonna describe how we solve this design challenge by first picking a good way to represent stacks with implementation choices embedded in, inside them. And then that representation is then going to allow us to design a mechanism that picks one of those stacks to use uh, for each individual connection at runtime. So Burbo's core abstraction to solve this problem is the channel. And the channel abstraction is how applications and libra libraries can agree on which implementations of a connection's features to use. So applications specify which channels they want to use, and then library developers provide implementations of those features using underlying services and underlying logic. So these roles are logically separated, and the people who perform them don't even necessarily need to know each other. Just as an application developer can use a library that's available in some kind of package registry on the internet, they can just like that use a channel implementation that a library developer provides on some, uh, on some public repository. So we'll first look at how application developers can use channels uh, before going into how we can implement them. And I'll get into this idea of optimizations a little bit later. So to see how channels work, let's start with the simplest possible building block in Bertha, which is a base connection with no fancy features. So examples of these might be the Linux kernel networking stack like we discussed a little bit earlier, or one based on DPDK or RDMA. So the application is gonna call send and receive, which is Bertha's connection API on this base connection. And then this base connection is just gonna shim calls to the underlying data path APIs. So nothing fancy has really happened yet. So now let's bring a channel into the picture. So channels work by taking in connections as input and returning new connections with some added features as their output. They're basically connection transformers. So in this example, we start with a base connection, which could just be a socket connection. And if we apply the serialization channel implementation to it, it'll return a new connection, which is a serializing connection uh, that encapsulates that inner connection. So when the application sends messages, the serialized connection is responsible for implementing its features, which are to serialize messages from application objects to bytes, and then pass those bytes into the base connection. And the base connection can then use whatever means it wants, for example, uh, the you know, Linux kernel networking stack uh, to actually carry out that communication. And of course, the reverse happens on the receive path. So that's how one channel works, but how can we compose different channels together? Well, the easy answer is that we've, we were able to provide one transformation, so we can just maybe do more transformations on that same base connection. Well, this actually, uh, it's a, it turns out to be a little bit more complicated than this because each channel can still have its own uh, data path interface that's unique to that channel. So for example, if we want to take this serialization connection that we defined on the previous slide that has this object interface and pass it into a TLS channel that's expecting bytes as the interface so that it can encrypt those bytes, this is not going to work because of type restrictions that this TLS channel developer would have specified. So instead, the application developer could instead compose the TLS channel with a connection type that matches its interface, like, a, like the base connection on the previous slide. And then uh, after that, take that connection and pass it into the serialization channel. So once their channel stack compiles, the application developer knows that the data path types in that stack are gonna be compatible with, with each other and are gonna work out. So then to re represent a choice between multiple implementations, the application developer can use what we call a select. So in this case, I'm showing two example implementations of the serialization channel uh, using bin code and thrift. So when Bertha is gonna make a connection, it's gonna compare the available implementations on each side of the connection and then pick compatible branches of the select. So these select points in the channel stack are how we represent the different stacks that the application can choose between when making a connection. Was there a question? 
Okay. Okay, so that's how an application developer can use tunnels to express the features that they want. And next we'll look at how these tunnel libraries are implemented. Okay, so tunnel implementations have two components and we'll look at how they work for this maybe local or fast path tunnel that we talked about a little bit earlier. So uh, the first component is this connection transformer functionality, which is just a function that takes the input connection and then returns a new connection that implements the tunnel. So in our case, the function is going to check whether the uh, peer address is local or not. And if it's local, it'll create a local connection and return it. And otherwise it'll use the input connection as the globally scoped remote connection. So note that this maybe local channel has branching in its output um, in, in, in the connection type that it outputs. So more generally, channels can specify this kind of branching logic based on information from the runtime environment. So for example, an uh, implementation of a TLS channel could check its runtime environment for the presence of a TLS offload. And if that offload is available, perform an implicit transformation that basically does nothing and then waits for the offload to actually do the work of TLS. But if an offload is not available, then it could uh, provide a channel implementation that, that performs that functionality in software. So the difference between this and a select is that with a select, Bertha uh, is going to check the compatibility at runtime uh, when it's establishing a connection, whereas by using this kind of internal branching in the channel implementation, the, the library developer is sort of saying that these two choices that are dependent on the runtime are not going to make a difference in terms of compatibility with the other side of the connection. So the, the channel developer is sort of making an assertion here. So this, this is the first component, which shows the actual composition. So the second component is gonna help with our other two problems of portability and runtime reconfigurability. So remember that with some libraries, there could be many implementations of the same tunnel uh, optimized to different network environments. Like remember the sharding example that we had. So the goal here is for Bertha to determine at runtime whether channel implementations of, at, um, of a different, uh, at each end of a potential connection are compatible with each other. So it would be nice if we could just sort of inspect the channel implementations to determine this mutual compatibility, but this approach has multiple problems. And the most important problem here is that in the most general case, checking equivalence is undecidable, so we can't really do this. So what we're gonna do instead is give up and ask the application or the, the channel developer to provide this abstract specification of the functionality that their channel provides. And then by comparing these abstract representations of channels, um, if they're equivalent to each other, then we're gonna decide that uh, these two uh, channels are compatible with each other. So, okay, what does this look like in Bertha, sort of putting it together? So the application developer is going to link with libraries that, yeah. So uh, the application developer is gonna link with libraries that provide different implementations of channels and then instantiate channels representing the features that they want in their connections or in their applications connections. And then they're gonna use this select construct to express choices between different implementations that they can make. So for our example application, we have in, we've linked with four libraries that provide implementations of this fast path functionality, a library that implements a TLS channel, and then two possible implementations of serialization. So then we can use composition and the select to make a channel stack that says that the connection should first serialize application objects using either bin code or thrift, depending on runtime compatibility checks, then encrypt those bytes and then route them correctly with a connection type that's based on the runtime environment. So from this channel stack, we can create a connection by e applying each of these connection transformations in sequence to build up a connection object that the application can then use as its data path. So with what I've described so far, it seems like we have enough to achieve both composability by layering channels into channel stacks and portability by using selects between multiple implementations. But there's a problem with that, what I've described so far. So ideally we would want fine grained channels, each of which specifies and implements a specific piece of the application's functionality um, and network processing, and then have application developers specify those in intuitive ways. But this approach is not unfortunately uh, great for performance. So the problem is that picking between implementations while it's useful isn't sufficiently expressive enough uh, of a mechanism to take advantage of opportunities for optimizations. So to see why, let's take another look at our microservice applications channel stack. So this stack is going to specify channels in the traditional order. So first it's doing application logic with serialization, then transport layer logic with TLS, and then routing, layer, routing type logic with um, the maybe local channel. But uh, even for local connections, this, the, the connections produced by this channel stack are going to encrypt bytes that are destined within the same machine. And that's sort of a waste of, of resources because uh, bytes that don't leave our machine don't really need to be encrypted. So Bertha's solution to this problem is to let domain experts define what we call stack passage, which are basically rule-based optimizations to the channel stack. 
These stack passes are analogous to optimizations used on data flow graphs in machine learning and uh, in data analytics and also within compilers. So we want domain experts to be able to specify these transformations without reasoning about channel stacks one by one. Instead, they should be able to specify general patterns of channels to replace, and then uh, different application developers can then apply those patterns to their, uh, the channel stack that they use for their application. So in Bertha, we define this pattern matching mini, mini DSL for a domain experts to write stack passes with. And being able to do this is a nice benefit of our channel stack structure, because there's a well-defined place with a, a regular structure that these domain experts can reason about to write their optimizations with. Okay, so with this optimization uh, that we did to apply a fused version of the channel stack that just checks whether the connection is remote and uses a TLS connection for these remote connections and then uses just the, the plain fast path connection for their local connection, we can sort of see the benefit of different levels of optimizations that Bertha is providing. So we can see the cost of encryption with TLS and then we can see the cost of virtual networking with UDP and then Bertha where we get our best possible fast path performance on this uh, local connection between two Docker containers. So I've discussed how we represent stacks in Bertha by using this channel abstraction. So Bertha's job now is to implement the core functionality that gives us portability and runtime reconfigurability by using the, by taking the stack and then choosing channel implementations to produce a connection that the application can use. So we call this process negotiation. So remember from before that channel implementations provide identifiers to make it possible to identify compatible implementations across the network. So there are two ways that channel implementations can combine, exact matching and composition. So exact matching is what we've seen so far. So both, both sides of the connection should match implementations exactly. So for example, if one side of the connection is using bin code for serialization, then the other side better also be using bin code, otherwise we're gonna get bugs at runtime. Meanwhile, compositional identifiers like sharding indicate that only one uh, connection participant needs to provide that feature. So if one side of the connection is going to provide the, the sharding on the client, then the server doesn't also need to provide an implementation of sharding. It's enough if one, of one side does it. So when we want to make a connection, what do we have? We have a channel stack on the client side, and we have a channel stack on the server side. And from this, we can get two sets of identifiers to compare, one representing this client's channel stack and one representing the server, server's uh, channel stack. So the client is gonna send the server a list of its possible channel stack, and then the server is gonna compare that to its local set of possible implementations, and then pick the possible options that are that are compatible. The server will then uh, choose one of these stacks for the, for the client to use and send it back. And if there aren't any such compatible stacks, then the server would return an error to the developer and the developer could then go fix this problem by providing more imp implementation options in the channel stack or uh, restructuring the application in some way. Okay, so to sum up, a Bertha connection starts as a base connection and a developer specified channel stack before being transformed by one or more optimizations at compile time. Then when it's establishing a connection, Bertha's negotiation functionality comes into play. It's gonna determine a compatible set of implementations between the connections participants and then pick one of them. And then after negotiation, Bertha produces a connection which the application uses as a data path. So there are a few more, uh, more uh, Bertha features that I won't have time to talk about today, including uh, adaptive batching in the data path, as well as uh, a way to do zero RTT negotiation. But what I am gonna talk about is a way to extend what I've discussed so far to multi-party connections. So what is a multi-party connection? While I've been explaining both of those core features and techniques, I've been using the traditional uh, setting of a client server type communication. But modern applications can use not only features like this client server type communication, but they can also use multi-party communication where there are multiple senders and multiple receivers in the same connection. Like for example, multicast or um, uh, cloud message queues. So this connection might even be entirely asynchronous, which means that the client, the senders and receivers might not even be there at the same time. So how can we do negotiation in this case? So the negotiation protocol actually turns out extends to this case without that much modification. And the simple trick that we're going to do is that instead of relying on a live server to make the decision for us, we're going to use a key value store to coordinate the negotiation. So when a client arrives, it picks a stack that it would like to use and then tries to set it as the connection's address in the key value store. And this connection's address is the key for the key value store. If there's already a value set, then the service will return that and the set will fail. And the client then has three options. It, two of the options are the same options as before. It can just apply that option, uh, apply the, the connections, the channel stack that's already in play to whatever its local channel stack is and start participating in the connection, or it can return an error to the developer. The third option is to do what we call an upgrade where the client changes the stack via two-phase commit, making sure that all of the other connection participants agree on the new stack before it comes into use. So let's look at a case where one of these upgrades would be useful. 
With published subscribe connections for which the application wants messages to be ordered, it turns out that it matters for performance and cost where this ordering is implemented. So one option is just to let the service handle it and use a FIFO queue in, um, in the cloud. And that's what's happening on the right side of this graph where we have slightly higher latency and actually slightly higher cost because uh, API calls on FIFO queues are more expensive. If there's only one sender and one receiver though, then it's actually more efficient and less cost to use a best effort uh, uh, cloud message queue and uh, handle ordering on the client. And uh, that would be a, a more efficient way to do things. But unfortunately, we can't do this all the time because we might not always have only one sender and one receiver. So in general, to solve this problem without Bertha, you would have to always use the FIFO queue uh, to handle the general case and pay this extra cost all the time. But with Bertha, because we can do runtime reconfiguration, we can sort of switch between these two modes depending on what state the connection is in and achieve the costs, uh, cost savings when it's possible. And this is a sort of cool aspect of runtime reconfigurability because there's no, no, no way that you can do this kind of dynamic transition without it. Okay, so that was my explanation of Bertha. So next I'm going to return to our connection, uh, our, our question about data path structure. I'm going to explore this. Yeah, what's up? You need 2PC because everybody needs to agree um, on what the channel stack is going to be at any given time. So if you try to do it unilaterally, then you might get some kind of bug at runtime because one of the clients thought we were using the old stack and another client using uh, is, is using the new stack. So it's not really about security. It's more about um, consist consistency. Yeah, thank you. How do you do it in the sense that you have to make sure that everybody's what do you mean? How do you do So runtime reconfigurability in, in, in terms of uh, Bertha is just switching between different channel stacks. So just like in this in this multi-party case, you could do it by uh, using two-phase commit to agree on what the channel stack should be. And then once you've agreed on the channel stack, the hard work is sort of done. Like you, you can use some kind of that that channel stacks connection bit as your data path, and you, you've, you've switched to using the new semantics. Not necessarily, right? If you're using a cloud message queue, then this, this sort of the cloud message queue is going to handle that for you. And like using this two, the using two PC will make sure that the old state, the old messages are drained from the old queue before you transition to the new queue. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, Derek's question was, how do we achieve? Uh, like, what is the what is the point of using two PC for um, the uh, connection upgrades and the answer was basically the 2pc is for consistency rather than security and then venkit's question was how do we do runtime reconfigurability and the answer was switching between different stacks and the 2pc uh consistency guarantees will make sure that uh this, the connection state is consistent ariel yeah yeah definitely so uh this is also part of the 2PC protocol. So like if you have some kind of timeout, then you might want you might need to like have your 2PC last a little bit longer before it successfully finishes. Oh, sorry. The question was uh, what happens if a, what happens if a client fails during uh, during 2PC? Does that make it a little bit harder? And the answer was uh, what I just said, like. Uh, yeah. OK. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to return to our question about data path structure and explore this in the context of congestion control, because as we'll see, congestion control is an especially dynamic component of modern data paths. And what I mean by dynamic is that we've seen a lot of growth in the number of proposed congestion control algorithms over the past few decades. And this isn't just the number of congestion control algorithms, but also their complexity, because recent approaches use more expensive computation and the use of machine learning in some cases. Uh, e even algorithms without complicated calculations like DBR can take weeks or months of effort to get right on an individual data path. So deploying these new algorithms with their complicated functionality might be even harder. So there's also a second type of dynamism, and I've rearranged this picture a bit to show what I call the cross product of sadness. So to deploy their protocol, a congestion control developer has to learn the ins and outs of each data path. So for example, in Linux, they have to learn how pacing works and what is the queue disk and what are the various levels of queues in the stack and, and how they interact with each other in order to successfully implement their algorithm. And then when a new data path comes along, the developer has to start from ground zero on this new data path's runtime. So they have to learn a new data, new API and the quirks of this new data path uh, to implement the algorithm there. And meanwhile, because there are so many different congestion control algorithms, a lot of uh, data path developers have simply chosen to care less about the uh, support for congestion control and offer no or very little uh, congestion control support. 
So to understand how we're going to address this problem, we'll first look at how congestion control fits into data paths today. So the application sends data to the data path, and the data path receives feedback from the network uh, and maintains statistics. And if it implements congestion control flexibility at all, it'll expose them via some custom API. And in the case of Linux TCP, this would be a pluggable TCP API. So developers can then write data path native code to express their congestion control algorithm. And then in Linux TCP, this would be a kernel module. So the question I'm interested in here is, how can we restructure the congestion control component of data paths to be reusable across the data paths, as well as untethered to computational demands of per packet processing, so that we can run interesting and complicated uh, calculations. So the key idea that we're going to propose is that we're going to encapsulate congestion control in a separate component and decouple this algorithm sophistication from the complexity of the data path runtime environment. And we call this new architecture the congestion control plane, or CCP. So CCP is going to provide a separate runtime outside the data path runtime for congestion control algorithms to run it. So there are two advantages to this design. So first is what we call write once run anywhere, where the same implementation of a congestion control algorithm can interface with multiple supported data paths and implement congestion control across all of them. Second is enabling more sophisticated algorithms because algorithm implementations aren't tied to the complexity of the data path runtime environment anymore. So this comes with an obvious trade-off. There's now latency involved in receiving information from and sending decisions to the data path. This is potentially bad for two reasons. So first, your algorithm might behave unexpectedly or differently than a data path native implementation. And second, you might get lower performance. So to address this performance question, we propose that congestion control logic should run asynchronously from the data path. So communication between the, uh, the two components of this now split implementation are going to happen maybe only once or twice in RTT instead of uh, on every packet as is traditional. So we need to support this asynchronous operation without compromising on either algorithm correctness or performance. And because each packet contains valuable information, we want to gather inf measurements from each packet, but we still want to make most of our decisions asynchronously. So what we're going to do is split algorithm implementations into two components, a slow path component that runs asynchronously and outside the data path runtime, and then a fast path component which operates synchronously with arriving measurements, but has a constrained API so that we can ensure that it won't affect our performance. So this is a significant departure from how developers implement congestion control today. And a little bit later, I'll walk through an example of how we can implement an algorithm in this new framework. So intuitively, this is going to end up working out because once or twice in RTT is sort of a natural time scale of congestion control. Since once you send a packet, it takes an RTT to observe what happened to it and react accordingly. So making decisions on that same time scale is uh, going to work out. So to support operation across multiple data paths, we developed a standard interface that data paths should expose. So this interface has two categories. So first, control primitives, which enforce decisions that algorithms make. So we support setting congestion windows and pacing rates. And second, this is the list of measurement primitives. Yeah, this is the list of measurement primitives that we support for use in data path programs. And we view this interface as sort of an evolving standard, but I'd like to point out that new congestion uh, control signals don't really come along too often. So we expect this list to remain roughly constant. And in the several years since we first worked on CCP in 2018, this list has remained roughly constant and there haven't been any congestion control algorithms which have come along using some exotic new uh, measurement signal. And furthermore, these signals are sort of standard information that data paths are already co collecting in the normal operation of, the, of their data paths, and they're not tied to a specific transport protocol. So it should be pretty straightforward to expose them to a congestion control component. Of course, some data paths might not support features such as uh, ECN. And in these cases, we envision that CCP algorithms, which rely on these unsupported measurement primitives, wouldn't compile for use on that uh, unsupported data path. So given these uh, primitives that we have, there are two components of the CCP data path API. So the first, which is shaded in gold here, is a shim layer which interacts with the data path. So in the case of the kernel, we use the pluggable TCP API to get access to the state we need to um, gather measurements and enforce decisions. So this is the part that needs to be implemented in a data path specific way, but its only job is to expose data path state, so it's relatively small, and it only needs to be uh, written once per data path rather than once per congestion control algorithm. So the CCP data path component, which is shaded in purple, is implemented in a library that we call libccp and is shared across the data paths. It communicates with the CCP agent and serves as the execution environment for data path programs, which uh, users write to specify the synchronous component of their algorithm implementations. These uh, programs are specified in the algorithm API and then installed into the data path. They have a very simple syntax and limited arithmetic capability uh, since they're intended for gathering measurements.
So we see here that we can actually get pretty good congestion control fidelity using this approach. So for two algorithms, COPA, which is a, a relatively new delay-based congestion control algorithm, first proposed at uh, NSDI 2018, and then Cubic on the bottom, which is a very traditional congestion control algorithm, the behavior of the same congestion control algorithm implementation across three data paths, so Linux TCP on the left, and then Quick, uh, Chromium Quick in the middle, and then MTCP, which is a DPTK-based data path on the right, is very similar. So the cubic sawtooth on the bottom is very recognizable as the behavior of cubic, but even the sort of more complicated triangle pattern of, of COPA is also relatively recognizable in the top row graphs. So there's of course a performance overhead involved in using CCP because of the larger number of context switches that you have to do. So in WAN-like conditions with link speeds up to one GPPS and then RTTs in the tens of milliseconds, there's no measurable CPU overhead that we could demonstrate. And these are the scenarios for which we designed CCP. But to stress test our implementations, we used both Linux TCP and then a CCP enabled TCP connections to saturate a 10 Gbps 100 microsecond link. So with one flow, again, the CPU utilization is indistinguishable from the baseline. But as the number of flows increases, while the CCP connections still can saturate the 10G link, there's a larger number of context switches corresponding to the increasing number of messages between the data path and the CCP agent. So in the worst case, there's approximately a 5% CPU extra CPU utilization on one core compared to the baseline. And we expect that it's possible to reduce this overhead with engineering improvements like batching, but we haven't really felt the need to do this because the CPU overhead has been relatively small. So let's sort of put this together into an example of how to implement a congestion control algorithm implementation in CCP. So I'm gonna use BBR as my example. So BBR's high level goal is to get an estimate of the bottleneck link rate and then set uh, the rate that it sends at and its congestion window to, to this bottleneck link rate and then the congestion window to some value derived from this bottleneck link rate and the min minimum RTT. So BBR has these two modes, probe RTT mode, where it tries to discover the minimum RTT and then probe bandwidth mode, where it tries to discover the bottleneck link rate. So to do this, BBR is going to modulate it rate, its rate with a pulse pattern. And if the measurement measured rate during the up pulse is higher than the previous estimate of the bottleneck rate, it's going to change its estimate of the bottleneck rate accordingly. So how are we going to implement this in, in CCP? So the way we implemented this, the data path program is going to provide per act measurements of the min RTT and the link rate that's, uh, that's, that's measured, uh, and as well as implementing this pulsing pattern. The asynchronous component is going to tell the data path to change its sending rate based on measurements that it's that are coming in, as well as uh, switching between these two modes of uh, probe RTT and probe bandwidth. So note that this is only one possible split of functionality between uh, the the data path and the CCP agent, and other possible splits of functionality for any given individual algorithm are possible. So there are other ways that we could have implemented BBR as well. So one nice thing about CCP is that it's been an enabler for some non-traditional data paths. As an example of one such non-traditional data path that uh, I've, I've worked on is the Bundler project where we explored a new type of middle box data path that can help domains apply scheduling policies to their traffic. The problem Bundler solves is that uh, the place that queues build in the network is not is, is the place where congestion uh, is, is the place where congestion occurs, and that's not necessarily the best place to apply scheduling policies to our traffic since sites at the edge of the network would have to somehow coordinate with the domain in which the con uh, congestion is happening. So with Bundler, we had this insight that if the site at the edge uses a congestion control algorithm on its traffic, then um, on its traffic aggregates or, or bundles, as we can see the, the blue and the orange are on this slide, then uh, the queues would form at the edge of the network where this bundling congestion controller is operating and we could apply our scheduling policies there. So one of the interesting questions here is how can we satisfy the CCP API from the data path side? So we have to gather measurements that our congestion control algorithm needs, but our data path is located in a middle box and doesn't really have access to end-to-end -end information like sequence numbers. And in fact, the traffic that we're running congestion control on might not even be TCP, so there might not be sequence numbers to read in the first place. So instead, we're going to use a packet sampling method to send out-of-band feedback from the receiver side middle box so that we can measure the RTT send and receive rates. And then from these, we can get estimates of the CCP primitives on the measurement side and then run our congestion control algorithm. So here we can see two measurements of a client running uh, cubic without bundler uh, on the left and then via bundler on the right. So we're using a delay based congestion controller, of course, via CCP to limit queuing at the bottleneck so that queues build at our bundler middle box um, instead of in the middle of the network. And correspondingly, uh, the queue in the middle of the network has shifted to the edge where we're running our congestion control algorithm, and then we can apply a scheduling policy to it. Uh, and, and get whatever uh, scheduling policy that we want over our traffic. So this is a sort of cool instance of CCP allowing us to use our congestion control algorithm implementations on these non-standard data paths. Okay, 
I think I have time for future work. So let's return to our original question, which is how has the adoption of modern network data pads changed the applications as well as the structure of these data pads? So I've discussed two implementations via uh, two systems that, I, that I've helped build, Bertha and CCP. So with Bertha, we discussed a way for applications to express network functionality that they want. And with CCP, we went into the data pads themselves with a discussion of how we can support complex congestion control functionality across these data pads. So uh, with Burpa, we're obviously not done yet. And one of uh, the positive aspects that you might re uh, remember from Bertha is that we have a well-structured description of the application stack, especially one that reaches upwards to encompass the communication libraries that the application is using. So this is gonna let us explore something of a trade-off space that, that has um, been emerging amongst pro uh, proposed data paths in recent years, which is the use of a queue per core with copies of the data path code running on each core versus a centralized data path which scales out individual components of itself. So with Bertha, since we have a standardized interface between the components of the stack, we might be able to support switching between these two modes to provide whatever uh, scaling semantics is best for the application's workload. And the right place to start here is going to be to gather an understanding of which workloads go best with each of these decisions, as well as related concerns like work stealing, interrupts, scheduling, and preemption. And once we have a good understanding of this, I think it would be really cool to build on top of Bertha to allow users to easily switch um, and navigate this trade-off space. So that's sort of the end of the, the technical uh, portion of this talk, but I would not be able to complete this defense without acknowledging uh, a lot of, like there are truly a lot of people who have helped me along the way. Um, so of course, the first people I have to thank are Ari and Mohamed, my advisors. They have always given really good advice. They um, will really cut to the core of whatever problem that you bring them uh, and, and sort of remove all of the fluff around it and, and really give you sort of very direct feedback and uh, and advice and everything that they've said has always turned out to be correct eventually. <laughs> and uh, the other two people I want to thank next are, are Scott and Panda, my other two committee members. So Scott is, is uh, Scott and of course Sylvia at, at Berkeley are, are basically the reason that I got into research in the first place as an undergrad. And I've really enjoyed the opportunity to, to continue working with them. And of course, Panda was also at Berkeley at the time. Um, and I've uh, really enjoyed uh, Panda's uh, friendship and mentorship over, over the past, uh, you know, however, however long I've been doing research. So uh, I'd really like to thank them for, for their, their support and their uh, work on Bertha. Uh, as well as uh, the other projects, the other multiple projects that we have going on. So uh, I really look forward to continue working with them, continuing, continuing working with them in the future. Uh, so next, I think we have uh, all of my collaborators. So as, as Hari uh, sort of alluded to at the beginning, I, I have a lot of collaborators uh, and I've, I've really had the chance to work with a lot of people over the years. Uh, I found pictures of, of some of them, but not all of them. I think uh, we have, uh, the pictures are of Saksham, who I worked on with uh, the Kofos project in, in like towards the beginning of grad school, uh, Pratish, who, Pratish and Frank, who I've worked on basically throughout grad school on, on CCP and Bundler, Arvind, uh, who worked with uh, me and Panda and Scott and Hari and Mohamed on, on the Bertha project, as well as Srinivas, um, who uh, was really, really helpful in, in terms of working on CCP and then also like the initial parts of, of thinking about Bundler. And then there's also some other people, so Margarita, who um, Margarita, Justine Rubin, and Inesh, who I worked on uh, with on this uh, synthesizing congestion controls project, um, and then Hongzi and Pari, uh, and various, various other people who I, if I had tried to list all the people on that project, that that would be the only project on the slide, so I, I could not list all of them, I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, on, RC, on the RCS project, Lloyd from Berkeley, as well as, uh, as well as the various other people on that project as well. So the, the next group of people is uh, NMS, I think. Yeah, NMS, uh, I tried to find some pictures. I did not have that many. So like this is from NMS ice skating. The second one is uh, from SIGCOM 2018 in, in Budapest. And then below that is from last week in, in Seattle at NSDI. And then this, is, uh, this picture is from uh, the hike that we went on. It's, I'm, it's very fortunate that we went on this hike because otherwise I would not have had a picture uh, to put on the slide. So thank you everyone for going hiking. 
Um, and then I also have to thank my, my second home during my PhD, which has been PDOS. Um, Yeah, it's a lag. <laughs> Let's try this. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this is uh, a get from PDOS retreat and then PDOS winter hiking. Uh, and I think that that was from the same winter hike. Um, there's also been many other PDOS retreats. I really enjoyed sort of talking about systems with uh, people in PDOS uh, over the years. Uh, I think a special shout out is due to John Jensett, who introduced me to Rust, and which uh, which is the language that both CCP and Bundler are written in. So uh, I've really enjoyed sort of getting into Rust and uh, and really un like being able to write like semi large or medium system medium sized systems in it. That's been very fun. And then we have like uh, my friends as well as the broader CCL community. So. Uh, both my friends at MIT from board games, from Muffin Monday, from playing soccer. Uh, there are too many of these people to list, but then also um, my friends in the broader research community. So that picture is from SOSB 2019. And then uh, my friends from undergrad, uh, that picture is from, from undergrad. And then uh, uh, some of the same people uh, at, a, at a wedding last year in India. And then also uh, my family. I, uh, I'm really indebted to my family for, for their support and my, their, their willingness to let me continue in grad school, despite uh, me continually not being able to finish uh, in time, at least for my grandfather's expe expectations. Uh, so I, I have appreciated their patience as well as their support. And then finally, of course, uh, my partner, Deepthi, who uh, is willing to pull it, put, up, put up with me. And, and tolerate my complaining as well as uh, offer technical support from time to time. So I, I really appreciate that as well as uh, thank you for coming and, and taking the effort to come from California as well as my, my parents have also come. So thank you, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, I, I really appreciate you coming either uh, both physically, as I said, or via Zoom. Uh, I'm sure there's people who I forgot to thank. So I'd like to just thank everyone uh, <laughs> just to make sure I cover, cover all the bases. Uh, so thank you very much uh, and uh, Okay, so we have we have some time for questions, and then before we get into the, we can ask maybe a few questions before going into the private session. Moin. Yeah, yeah. So for even faster networks, um, one thing you can do is make decisions even less often. So, so uh, this is sort of. Uh, this, this, this simulation is still at uh, 10G, but is at lower RTTs. So it's sort of a similar effect because uh, the, the BDP is becoming smaller. So one, one thing that you could do is uh, instead of making a decision once per RTT, you can make a decision like once every two RTTs or once every 10 RTTs or even, even less. So the way that I think you would probably scale to 100G is some combination of like data path support for moving faster um, and then having this like libccp data path api also like carried along with that uh, data path support for for high high bandwidth data paths as well as if you make decisions less often then there's less work that you have to do and hopefully the congestion control also ends up working out and and this graph is sort of uh, initial evidence that it could end up working out like that yeah i think uh, sudarshan and you also oh, will you had a question uh, on yep uh, use TCP, figure out what split would be best. Uh, yeah, so the, the TCP implement, like the Linux implementation has everything in the data path. So it's going to like the way that implementation works, you have to make a decision, like, app comes back, your callback gets called, you have to make a decision, what are you going to do right now? Uh, with TCP, it's sort of a different, uh, different model. Sorry, um, I forgot to repeat the question. So Will's question was, uh, uh, how would you, if you could, you look at the TCP implementations of something like BVR to figure out how to split implementations. And my answer is basically uh, that implementation slides the slider all the way into all completely inside the data path, um, and uh, being able to sort of pull components out into the asynchronous component of your of your uh, algorithms API is what's going to save you, as as Moeen asked, like the cycles in terms of uh, being able to make decisions less often and, and being more scalable. So uh, what you would probably want is something that like is more on the other side. And I don't think you're going to get that by looking only at uh, data path implementations of your algorithms. But obviously, like 
uh, it's very important to look at the full data path original implementation to know what algorithm what the algorithm is actually doing so that you make sure that the whatever you implement is doing the same thing. To this slide? This one. The next one? Yeah. This one? <laughs> so this is the, yeah, after this, I started talking about bundler. Ah, this, this slide, this slide. So yeah, this, I actually, I didn't talk about the performance impact of bundler at all. The only thing I wanted to demonstrate is that we can run like congestion control on this non-traditional data path. So it depends on the BDP of your network. So your congestion control algorithm, which is delay controlling, will try to maintain some queue in the, the queue in the middle of the network. So this is, this is a visualization, but uh, the number of packets there could be, it depends on like whatever the delay based congestion control algorithm you use is doing. Uh, on the other side, uh, like the amount of queue that builds up at the middle box depends on what congestion control algorithm the endpoints are using. So both of those things will depend on uh, various dynamic uh, runtime scenarios. Yeah, Derek. Um, do you find that the Rust type system affected a lot of the kind of uh, kind of composition you allow in tunnels? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of the a lot of the composition comes from like how the Rust type system is structured. Like the fact that we can uh, do this like static type checking of the data path compatibility comes entirely from the Rust type like Rust type system. That was how we check the compatibility at runtime. But the runtime comp uh, at, at compile time, but the runtime compatibility is external to the Rust type system. Like all we're getting from the Rust type system is the ability to express these identifiers and then collect these identifiers into a single data structure that we can transmit. But the like comparison at runtime, the Rust type system has nothing to do with that. Like we had to implement that ourselves. Okay. Were there any questions on Zoom? I well, like uh, if people can raise their hands or or chat or send a chat message if they have questions. Okay. Okay. Cool. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.